Hi, my beautiful business owners. I'm Jordan Ilderton. I am here today with Tiffany Brown. She's an attorney. We're going to do a fun little Q&A. So um, I know a lot of people out there have questions like, should I get an attorney? When do I need to talk to an attorney? So I figured this would just be a good way to talk to her and just bring her our questions and get some information. So Tiffany, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. And let me first start off, Jordan, just by thanking you for having me on. I think yeah. it's wonderful that you're in the practice of um, educating not only your clients, but your viewers and followers. And that is absolutely something that I endorse for all professions. So thank you for having me. Yes, it's so um, fun, Tiffany. Thanks. Absolutely. So a little bit about myself. I am uh, originally from the Carolinas and uh, grew up in North Carolina but uh, actually went to law school in New York. And so a lot of my practice uh, has been based out of New York as well as California, where I currently reside. And I focus in the area of uh, business law. Uh, my practice began uh, doing corporate work for large companies and I enjoyed it, but have found a lot of delight in working with small business owners as well as nonprofits and foundations. So that is the bed and brother of my practice. Well, good. We are glad to have you. And we put some questions out there to social media. And the first one is, what are some ways that small businesses need an attorney, but they may not even be aware? Yeah, I love this question. It, uh, for me, is about really educating individuals, business owners, people who may be curious about starting a business as to where you would want to consider integrating an attorney into your um, into your your model business model. I think a lot of people's assessments or ideas of attorneys are based on what they see on television. Mm -hmm. And so, even when I speak with uh, young people, primarily about being an attorney, they initially will just ask me what it was like for me in court and what's it like going to court on a regular basis and not necessarily having a full understanding of sort of the spectrum of what um, lawyers are able to do. And so I, I feel like what a large part of what I like to do is just sort of educate people with regards to um, just how full the practice of law is and that it extends beyond just doing sort of high level, high energy, um, emergency type of work. Um, I would liken it to even the way that you sort of have a doctor um, and you, you um, have regular checkups, you see someone annually um, versus only going to see a doctor when you have an emergency care. You know, the beauty of having a relationship with a lawyer is that they get to know about you. They get to know a lot about your risk profile. And many of the engagements that you can have early on with a lawyer are actually um, usually done at no cost at all. It's you uh, simply identifying uh, a lawyer either by just, you know, going on Google, um, or some type of doing some type of internet search or asking around, you know, with people, uh, other people, whether or not they have a, a lawyer mm -hmm. and um, what they use their lawyer for. And you develop a relationship with a lawyer before you actually need one. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the biggest, um, the biggest way in which I would shape people's thinking is that instead of looking at a lawyer and engaging them for only sort of emergency type work, like when you need, you know, uh, there's a practice that I used to have when I was working with, um, you know, larger clients that they only reached out to me when they had an emergency. And that emergency was if they needed money very quickly mm -hmm. or if they needed to sell something. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of in-between work that lawyers can do. And so, you know, my first suggestion would be to just simply develop a relationship with a lawyer and uh, find out a little bit about them, find out about their practice. And you can do that without any cost. And uh, that would allow a lawyer to be able to give you holistic advice, or which I know is a big part of your practice, Jordan. Yeah. Um, and that would allow them early on 
uh, to get to know you before an emergency comes. And then you would be surprised at when you do reach out for help, how little uh, work you actually need done. So yeah, I would say that would be my suggestion is that um, because I think most people don't fully recognize just how full a legal practice uh, can be is just to become familiar with sort of what oh, the work of your attorney, um, uh, you know, I think preferably local, somebody that you can see relatively easily um, is able to do. Yeah, good. I love that. So it's basically like just getting the conversation started. Like if you know an attorney or find someone that just kind of speaks to you, just, you know, introducing ourselves and, you know, getting the conversation going and then you know, as the relationship builds, you know, using them as a resource where it needs. And um, yeah, I think that's a great, a great tip for us to do. Um, yeah, because you think of it as mostly like, well, I need to do this. So let me call someone. Um, whereas having that relationship, I can see where that would be really beneficial. So, you know, to switch gears, and this is a question that I submitted. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of businesses, you know, they start doing one thing. And then as the years go on, they kind of move and change. And it's, I've seen this a lot with COVID too, you know, businesses have had to pivot and adjust and, you know, kind of redefine their services and products. And so, you know, if the name of the company really isn't fitting what the company was doing, you know, now is doing, you know, what's something they can do because, you know, tell me about the doing business as, or any of the legal name changes. Um, can you just speak to that for us? Absolutely. And I will start off by saying I love DBAs. I think that they are very uh, great tools. They're used by small businesses. They're used by large businesses. And so I don't think there's anything, um, there's nothing second class about uh, using DBAs. They're a really great vehicle, I think, for piloting ideas. Mm -hmm. And so as you mentioned, you know, COVID has uh, made all of us have to think about our business models to be, you know, it's given us time to think about uh, business models. And, and, I, and I hope that despite all that has happened, that creativity is something that uh, people walk away from. And sometimes, you know, you are, as you mentioned, like doing business in a, uh, one particular manner and you're just rethinking it. And a new name is something that you want to add you know, to go along with it, to make it feel mm -hmm. like you're really making a change. You, yeah. you want to kick the tires on something and a DBA is a perfect way to pilot that. Okay. The fee for doing DBAs varies by state. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say the most I've seen a DBA is about a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in South Carolina that it's, it's relatively, um, small, of, of, I think perhaps $25 in, in South Carolina. And that is very much an administrative change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, so much of my practice is about educating. I don't necessarily encourage people to take on legal costs if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my first uh, suggestion uh, with regards to uh, changing a name would be that you call the Secretary of State and every state has them. Uh, they are, that is the governing body that registers businesses. And they have numbers that are open to the public that you can call and simply tell them that I want to put a DBA, associated DBA with my company. There's a form, many of them can be done virtually, that you can fill out and add uh, the DBA to your company. Now, there are some states, and uh, thankfully, South Carolina is not one of them, that anytime that you do business, you actually have a very old-fashioned um, requirement of having to uh, put it in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really old school yeah. uh, with this requirement. New York is one of those states. Wow. Uh, and you actually need an attorney or either a registered agent to post um, posts that you're going to be uh, operating as a company with a particular name in that state. And wow. I don't know when the laws are going to change so that this is no longer required. It is very much an old school um, requirement. And um, 
that I would say can make the the just taking on a DBA a bit um, a bit cumbersome and 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 may not be worth doing it until you are ready to actually change your name because the process is very long. But thankfully, um, in a state like uh, South Carolina, you don't have to do that. You can issue a DBA, um, and I would suggest only doing it for a pilot period of time. Okay. If you are really, if you haven't yet acquired intellectual property for a name, um, you just want to try it on, do the DBA, see how it feels. Uh, and, you know, this way you don't have to change your bank account name. You don't need to change your name with the Department of Revenue, um, with uh, anything really, um, when you are doing it this way. But I think that should only be for a period of like one or okay. two years. I wouldn't go beyond that only because there are other areas in which, uh, you know, it can be very confusing. So I think often about credit card statements and if people are paying you as a business with a credit card, it's going to have typically the name that you have registered mm -hmm. it under. And unless you have gone through um the work of actually updating it with the credit card registry, um, you're going to, it, it, if when someone makes a charge, it's going to say the name of your old business. Okay. And that's going to be, it will, I think, a, after an amount of time, uh, just be too much brand confusion for your clients. And so okay. I don't recommend doing it for a long period of time. Okay. So you recommend the DBA as, to try to, you know, test something out and then eventually either changing the name or maybe starting a new entity with the name, um, but not using the DBA indefinitely. Correct, correct. Only because uh, I think it just uh, really begs the question why you're leaving the other one open. If you are planning to go back to it, are those entities, what you're doing separate, so separate that maybe you just need to have two different businesses. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Oh, good, thank you. Very good information, I appreciate that. Um, so our next question is, um, and this, you know, this is something that a lot of CPAs get. So I imagine a lot of attorneys get the question too. What advice on structuring businesses do you have? Um, tell us a little bit about how you answer that question. Sure. And you're absolutely right. This is a question that I, I do get often. What I am loving about, um, I would say, uh, COVID is that it's made conversations across industries much easier because people are using Zoom and video conference. We're developing relationships. And so, you know, like you and I, mm -hmm. two different industries that serve uh, clients, we actually have uh, one client in common mm -hmm. that uh, allow us to have conversations and see sort of, um, sort of what our suggested strategy would be. Um, for a client approach. And so I do recommend uh, within sort of this holistic model that uh, you um, refer to, Jordan, that, that people do have not only a lawyer that they're in conversation with, but an accountant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I strongly advise my clients to get accountants. And I'm so happy now that I have one that I can <laughs> refer them to um, that I'm friends with. And so I think that um, this is really something that you should have consultation on both sides with, mm -hmm. you know, on my particular side as an attorney, my question often involves risk. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that you're trying to do? I always start by looking at what is, you know, sort of the desired outcome that you're, you're looking to accomplish. You know, if you are going into business for the first time and have, never engaged in a business before and what you're planning to offer is just simply service uh there's no product or anything involved i would suggest testing it out mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm really big on testing for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs uh and i would suggest that you just simply operate as a sole proprietor mm -hmm. and go as simple as possible when you first get started only because there are a lot of fees associated with uh, there are fees associated with the business structure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes you can actually do 
a business for six months to a year and decide that you don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And you've already uh, taken on the added expense of doing separate accounting for it uh, and uh, setting up, you know, various uh, uh, structures uh, for it and maybe even getting the intellectual property for it. And you change your mind. And so for me, my biggest goal is to spend as little as possible mm-hmm. when you're in the testing period. Now, if you are a more seasoned um, entrepreneur and or what your work is um, engaging in revolves, involves a lot of uh, interaction with individuals, if you're selling a product and you're bringing in a lot of income or you have income that you're worried about Mm-hmm. Um, someone may be accessing, let, let's say, if you were sued, then you're going to want to put a stronger structure mm-hmm. around your company. And I would strongly suggest that you do consider having a business structure. Now, what business structure you decide is really based on what your goals are. And your goals uh, from a a tax perspective are very necessary to know. And this is where the conversation with the accountant comes in. You know, if you plan to bring in a certain amount of money and you don't want to touch the money, I would say for a certain amount of time, if you're trying to, um, you know, take on a very large number of employees, all of those will impact, all of those questions will impact Um, sort of your tax structure. And that's where having a conversation with a tax accountant or just accountant is very, very helpful to have. Yes, I agree. Thank you. I love that holistic approach. I think, you know, it's so great for the, you know, CPAs and the attorneys to all be on the same page and to each know, you know, kind of what the other's thinking and where they're coming from so that, you know, we can best work with the client and the business owner to really give them what they need and what's best for them. So I appreciate you for saying all that. And we'll do one more question. Um, how can I protect my intellectual property? And, you know, mm-hmm. this kind of goes in with, you know, what contracts should my business have? I, you know, those were two separate questions, but, you know, I might kind of lump them together if that's okay. Um, you know, just speak to that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure thing. And I'll start off with regards to what type of contracts um, a business should have. The... Uh, contract uh, question is 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 interesting because the definition of a contract is someone makes you an offer and you accept, and that's a contract. And so, the strongest way to enforce that is to have it in writing. And the formal contracts that we see that you will sign. Um, and you'll have another party sign. That's sort of the formal way of it being done. I have to take into account that, you know, having grown up in the Carolinas, seeing how people do business, um, that there is a regional sort of diversity that comes in doing business. You know, uh, I would say that, you know, your word in the South, you know, that phrase, your word is your bond Mm -hmm. is really true. Like people really do stand behind Um, what they say and could even be offended if Mm -hmm. they offer you something and you say, okay, this is great. I need you to sign this contract Mm -hmm. for me. Um, And so my goal is, you know, not to get overly legal um, with a business, particularly when you're thinking about where you're located, you know, regionally and how people do business. Cause I absolutely respect, um, respect that, that is not the same Mm -hmm. in every location. My suggestion uh, is for any type of agreement that you have with someone that it is in writing in some way. Mm -hmm. And just to give you an example recently of something that happened with me, I actually had a client who I was uh, working with to get uh, sort of some future from strategic planning done for his business. And I was very um, happy, but he wanted me to sort of uh, pressure test the person that he had selected. That person offered to do it at a lower price than what they normally charge, which I thought was very generous. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until a month later that the client was actually going to pay the individual. Now, there had been no contracts Mm -hmm. exchanged. 
um, no contracts as far as formal contracts. Mm -hmm. But what did happen is that the individual had sent an email. A month later, the person had just forgotten that they decided to do that discount. And so they had billed the client for a higher amount, sent them an invoice. If it were not for that email, it would have been, even in a friendly situation, it would have been very tense on both sides because you would have had one person who felt that they had been taken advantage of and the other who just didn't remember mm -hmm. suggesting that it be done at a lower amount. And so I think it's very important um, when you look at what type of contracts that you should have, that you just look at baseline, what is a contract? Mm -hmm. um, it's offer and it's acceptance of that offer and you just have it in writing. If it's an email, if it's a text message, all of those work. And if you want the most, um, I, I would say the strongest protection and particularly I would say the larger the amount, the stronger the protection that you need, mm -hmm. do it in a formal, in a very formal way where you mm -hmm. have, have it written, written out. And so um, that, that would be my suggestion with regards to what type of contracts to have for a business, yeah. I would say always have yeah. something written down. Thank you. Um, that makes it that. so much more simple. I appreciate that, you know. Yes. Um, make it simple for us. So um, so then the intellectual property, um, you know, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, I'd say intellectual property is one of those pilot uh, areas that I don't suggest jumping into right away because of the cost. Mm -hmm. you know, my goal really as a lawyer is not to um, run up unnecessary bills. It's really to protect you. Like that is really what I do as lawyers, provide protection for my clients. And so uh, I would ask first, you know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish by you know, securing um, any type of intellectual property uh, for, your, for a name or, and, and for your business? If it's just, it seems like this is the, the right thing that I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. um, that for me isn't enough to suggest that you do it. Um, I think there's a lot of, particularly now, use of so many names within social media. Um, you can start um, you know, uh, your own company without securing, necessarily securing the name by just securing the web address. Mm -hmm. So I would first start by requesting anyone who asked me uh, about securing intellectual property rights, that they do some diligence and ensure that that name is not already widely used. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, depending on what type of name it is, if it's just sort of like a, 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 a basic name, there may be some challenges to actually securing it. And so, you know, that's where having, I think the relationship with an attorney could be really helpful because, um, you know, the more unique something is um, and, and maybe part of your efforts in um, doing your own pressure testing is asking a few people, what do you think about this name? Mm -hmm. If you get people who are immediately like, wow, like that's really cool. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I like it. I love it that might be a good indication to you that you have something really hot that you don't want anybody else to know. Mm -hmm. If you say a name and people are like, hmm, I, I've kind of heard that before, mm -hmm. you know, there's likely less protection um, if you were trying to secure the name and I wouldn't necessarily run and suggest that you get it, you get it um, secured. The benefit of intellectual property is to protect other people from, from, using your name without your consent and making money from it, making money from the hard work that you've done um, of, 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 of building your business. But if a name is already widely used, then it's a question of whether or not, um, you know, how much effort you want to put in place to actually further secure, further secure that name. Gotcha. And then, so how does that, like, so we talked about the name, but what about kind of like content? Like if someone is creating a program that they're going to put out there online for people to use, um, is that something that they need to kind of worry about protecting or, you know, is that not, you know, if it's on their website and people pay for it, part of their program, is that just like a given that it's protected? Well, I think, 
Well, it's interesting that you say given because there are, so there, there was an older process of registering um, for any type of written work that, and or uh, video content where you actually sent it into the copyright office. Mm -hmm. um, now you can actually copyright your own work by simply putting a copyright around it in a date. Mm -hmm. um, and then you take a further step of, of, of registering it at the copyright office. If it's something that you really feel like needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you write an original song, um, you absolutely should go through um, the efforts of, of, of registering it. Songs are a little bit different. Um, if you're doing video content, I think just simply um, indicating that this was something that you uh, copy wrote at a certain date, that's strong enough. Um, and I think the biggest thing that uh, comes up with copyrights is timestamp. Okay. Um, because if you wanted to show if somebody used your work later and didn't uh, attribute it to you, um, that you were the first person to come up with it. Okay. And um, I think it just depends on how sensitive the con content is. You know, the more uncomfortable you feel with your content being out there and someone uh, potentially uh, creating works around it without your permission, the more steps that you need to take in order to secure it. But I would say for the general user um, who's putting something on YouTube, you know, that copyright mark that you would put on it on your own, like if you're doing a YouTube video, is enough okay. to really secure it and to give you the right to then go to someone if they're utilizing your work to say, you know, we published this on YouTube in 2018, you're just coming out in 2022 mm -hmm. with something that is obviously copying our, 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 our work. We need you to take it down. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany. That was very helpful. Um, I really appreciate you answering these questions today. And, you know, like we mentioned before, our goal is to educate and just help business owners um, have as much information as possible and have resources for anything they need. So, you know, I just like to tell everyone that hopefully you got something out of this today and that if you know a business owner, please share it with them. Sharing is caring. We love getting all this information out there and we appreciate all your feedback and we really appreciate you being here and listening. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Thank I'm looking you, forward to having you on so that I can get some uh, really good downloads from you with regards to accounting I, for my clients. I love your your joke that we need to work on. An accountant and an <laughs> attorney walk into a, a Zoom call. What are they going to talk yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> I right, love well, thank it. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks.